All right, so I will be reacting to Milo Wolf's recent video titled Why Power Building is Not an Abomination Science Explained. This isn't to continue the debate of bodybuilding versus powerlifting because to this point, I've got most of my points across and I think at some point it just does become beating a dead horse. If the debate continues and there's new points brought up, so be it. I'm happy to contribute and build my counter arguments or if I agree with it, then sure, I'll agree with it. Uh, this video in particular, I have listened to it one time through when I was driving home today. I did hear a few points that I do want to counter, and I think this is a good opportunity for me not to just debate power building versus bodybuilding like we've done this whole time, but actually to build on some bodybuilding principles and methods that I like to use in my training and that I am an advocate for. So with that being said, let's get into it and figure out if I can even record my screen. I don't know if I can. Looks like it's good to go. Let's get to it. First, what is power building? And secondly, why do people use it? Power building is a training method almost always used by people who don't compete in bodybuilding or powerlifting, who just really want to enjoy training and get a really good amount of muscle growth and strength gains. What does power building look like? Well, usually they'll focus on the main three lifts, the squat, the bench, the deadlift, getting stronger in those to some degree, right? That could be one rep max strength. It could be three rep max strength. It could be more general strength, around five rep max strength. But generally, they also want to see their squat, bench, and deadlift improve in terms of strength. So generally agree. I think power building, since it is a direct combination of power lifting in, in the literal word itself, I think it's safe to assume that most people would view power building as increasing your one rep max in those specific lifts as much as possible. And obviously, you can still technically power build when trying to increase your three and your five rep max. That's totally fine. Kind of a nitpicky point, but I would say most of us that are or were power builders were trying to increase our one rep max as much as possible. However, they also want to get a lot of hypertrophy, usually all over their body, which is kind of what separates them from powerlifters. One, they don't necessarily care about competing. And two, they also want growth in other areas like their back, like their biceps, like potentially their calves. Sorry, Omar. And because of this, here's what their training sessions usually look like. They start with some variation of the squat, bench, or deadlift for relatively low reps, usually between one and six reps. They might do a squatting variation, a benching variation, and then maybe the rest of their session is dedicated to hypertrophy work. Typically, the rest of their session as a hypertrophy work is pretty hypertrophy optimized. They might do relatively higher reps. They might do a variety of rep ranges. They might pick exercises that are more stable, that allow them to get a better stretch. Essentially, the aim of power building is to get a good deal of muscle growth and a good deal of strength without competing and while just enjoying your training. Having a kind of natural flow to your sessions as far as starting a session a little bit heavier, doing those heavy lifts on the squat bench deadlift, and then moving on to hypertrophy work that's going to help you put on size. This is pretty accurate and I think if you're power building properly, this is exactly how it should be done. In my experience, in practice, in a lot of the cases, people do tend to heavily bias power lifting when you take a power building program. From what I've seen in, in the community, because I've obviously been a part of the power building community for a while, obviously not anymore, but I was for quite a while. In practice, a lot of the time this turns into basically power lifting with a lot of fluff and pump work it's very easy to get overly attached to your numbers on the big three and have that be the motivating, exciting part of your training that you get most of your psychological reward from. When it comes to the bodybuilding work, it's always gonna be after. And from a programming perspective, technically it makes sense. If your goal is to get as strong as you can on the big three in a powerlifting sense and to get as big as possible, powerlifting is going to override size. So at that point, I would say power building is a little bit more skewed to powerlifting than bodybuilding. I wouldn't say it's an even split. But in practice, I do see a lot of the time people will program so perfectly their squat bench deadlift and set these up to make them the biggest priority ever. And then the bodybuilding work turns into fluff and pump. A lot of the time it's just programmed curls as three sets of 10 or push downs, three sets of 10, no cues on setup. Nobody pays attention to your form on there. Nobody pays attention to your effort or intensity. It's just treated as fluff and pump work. And of course, this is up to the individual to decide if that work is worth pursuing to the, their fullest efforts. A lot of the time it doesn't end up being like that. So I'm not trying to say you can't power build because of course you can. 
But I do think in a lot of cases, especially if you're unaware of the psychology of it, you are going to be leaving a lot of size gains on the table. I do it with myself per personally. I would put all my eggs in one basket, go hard on the big three. And then when you have a successful session with the big three and you hit them hard, everything else is just kind of boring in comparison because you have a strength oriented mindset to start the session. You're just in that mood to lift heavy weight and push heavy weight. And it's not fun to go do something like a lat pull down or a tricep push down or a leg extension after, and you end up leaving gains on the table. And of course, this isn't a, a concrete, tangible thing that you can't fix, but I think it's it's basic psychology that can get in the way of a lot of lifters. And that's why I do think natural hypertrophy's point about the spider mode physiques does show up a lot of the time. And that's why I think you see a lot of power lifters or power builders have developed power lifting muscles like your glutes, your hips, the quads to a big extent, the chest, and they always seem to have arms, calves, etc. lacking because in reality, power lifting in the short term is more rewarding and it's more exciting than bodybuilding, especially if you're doing both at the same time. Bodybuilding is very different and I hate when people say it's an art form, but I think that's the only way I can properly put it. It's not as competitive in the short term. It's more of you're just chipping away at something. So it's not as thrilling. And I think when you put something as exciting and as thrilling as powerlifting can be, uh, that can override your desire to truly train your bodybuilding movements hard. Now to get one thing out of the way immediately, is power building the best approach for gaining size? No, that's bodybuilding. Is power building the best approach to make you a better power lifter? No, that's power lifting. However, power building is basically never used to make you the best in terms of size or in terms of strength or in terms of competing in bodybuilding or competing in power lifting. That was never the aim. So he's correct in that and I do appreciate that. I would say there was a very long time where the mainstream definition of power building, where it would be a perfect mix of chasing one rep max power lifting and chasing maximum size. There was a very, very long time where that was treated as the best way to get bigger, to have a one rep max that you're chasing for in a certain strength standard promises you to be bigger. And you have to have a movement that you do progressively overload to grow and everything else is just kind of pump work. This was treated as the best way for bodybuilding for a very long time. I know in our niche little community, 95% of us disagree with that. And we understand the difference between powerlifting and bodybuilding and power building. And we understand that in power building, you're sacrificing your potential on both of the, of the endeavors. A lot of this, when you go to the mainstream of lifting, a lot of people still don't understand that. And there's still a huge community. There's an entire generation of, of people, lifters about my age, that still don't understand this. And I know we live under a rock in this little niche and we seem to forget that a lot of the time. Like keep in mind, when I made my channel, I was coming from the mainstream where programming just makes no sense. Nobody think, can think critically. It's just a sheep mentality with everybody and everybody just copies each other and nobody actually thinks for themselves. So this community, I 100% think is much better at critical thinking. I think it's a little bit more of an information and education based community, which I love, but we have to keep in mind that we're the minority. And just because us right now in our tiny little niche community understands this stuff, that doesn't mean there's still not people. I would say the majority of people that still don't understand that power building isn't better than bodybuilding. Always. For, for hypertrophy, of course. The aim was always to get a blend of both and to just enjoy your training. Your goals might not neatly conform into those of a bodybuilder or those of a powerlifter. And that's exactly what powerbuilding is for. But alongside mentions of things like spider physiques and other strange notions, natural hypertrophy has called powerbuilding an abomination. And so within this video, while trying to remain pretty civil, let me respond to some of those critiques. First, natural hypertrophy makes the claim that weight building, the combination of weightlifting and bodybuilding, or strong building, the combination of strong man and bodybuilding, would be just as good. So why the obsession with power building? Let me touch on weight building first. It's unlikely weight building would be as good as power building for hypertrophy for about four distinct reasons. Reason number one, weightlifting has a pretty strong technical component you will often fail lifts because your technique wasn't perfectly on point. For hypertrophy, this isn't great. Whereas powerlifting with relatively slower movement velocities, allowing you to get a little bit closer to failure is a lot better. Lifts also aren't as technical. That brings me to my second point. In weightlifting, you have very few eccentric contractions. After the lift is over, you typically just drop the weight. 
and eccentrics, as we know from the research, are actually fairly important for hypertrophy. Reason number three. From the research we have, weightlifting may or may not have higher injury rates than powerlifting. And so when you're looking for something to complement bodybuilding training, maybe powerlifting is a little bit less injurious. The same applies to strong building or combining strongman with bodybuilding training. Strongman does seem to have notably higher injury rates than powerlifting. Finally, as far as strong building is concerned, many strongman exercises are isometric contractions, which again, miss out on the benefits of eccentric contractions. There is also a lot of strongman exercises that are typically limited by cardiovascular ability than actual hypertrophy effect. And so when we're talking about combining two different disciplines that allow you to get a good amount of strength, but also a good amount of hypertrophy, Powerlifting lends itself a little bit better to gaining size than either weightlifting or strongman and specifically with lower injury rates. So I entirely agree with him here. I think this makes a lot of sense. The way that you have to view lifting, not the way you have to, I don't know why I said it like that, but the way that I like to view lifting and exercise selection is there's a spectrum. There's obviously lifts on one side that are purely optimized for hypertrophy. And then there's another side of the spectrum where you can, even, let's not even say it's lifting for now. Let's say it's like, playing a sport let's say it's running so running is obviously not very optimal for hypertrophy but your legs are going through some form of range of motion but you're always going to fail due to cardio fatigue and uh, your range of motion is obviously tiny there's very little resistance you might see the tiniest little bit of gains just because you're actually like moving and doing something but that's all the way on this side of the spectrum strongman is probably somewhere in the middle where you are getting some good resistance but it's just an isometric weightlifting probably a little bit closer to bodybuilding than it would be running in terms of an actual hypertrophy stimulus you can get powerlifting i would say is even closer to bodybuilding than weightlifting i think that's basically what he said too but at the same time powerlifting isn't trying to maximize hypertrophy so it can't be all the way on the, the side of the spectrum which would be bodybuilding with powerlifting you're essentially trying to lift as much weight as you possibly can within the rules by any means necessary so with that let's say your range of motion on bench is is two inches because that's we see that all the time same with deadlifts let's say your range of motion is tiny is that going to give you any stimulus I would say it's probably less than you get from strongman, even with a proper isometric into strongman, just because the range of motion is so tiny in a very shortened position, where at least in strongman, if you're carrying a big stone or something, at least you're getting a decent stretch there. So we can talk the, the little details about that all we want, but basically what I'm trying to say is powerlifting is the opposite of trying to maximize range of motion, eccentric control and stimulus. You're trying to move as much weight as possible within the rules and you're not this isn't general strength general strength would be between powerlifting and bodybuilding somewhere in there depending on your technique but there is a spectrum and of course there are some movements that are purely optimized for hypertrophy and there's some on the other side that are just regular movements that you may get the tiniest little bit of hypertrophy from and then everything else falls somewhere in between there on that spectrum is that the squat bench deadlift are really not great exercises for hypertrophy and the better alternatives might be, in this case, the push-up or the dip instead of the bench, the hack squat instead of the squat, and the RDL instead of deadlift. By and large, I do agree with this. So, yeah, with this, I would say, ultimately, it comes down to how you do your squat, bench, and deadlift, and it comes down to your individual build. When it comes to a technique and like a very physical approach to these lifts, they can absolutely be very stimulative lifts if you do them properly and you suit and you modify the lift to your structure and you have an intent in mind. I would more so say it's the psychological factor of these lifts that a lot of people have a very hard time maximizing for hypertrophy because with hypertrophy, when you're training for pure size, you're going to be having this little bit of a buffer room where you're not actually using the most weight you possibly could. I made this case in my other video in response to natural hypertrophy and bald omni-man where let's say I'm doing a preacher curl. My working sets right now are 100 pounds for like seven, eight or nine reps. If I was to maximize strength by maybe bouncing the weight a little bit, going much faster on the eccentric so I don't build as much fatigue, I could probably get the same weight for maybe 12 reps. So there's always going to be that buffer room. And I think on a lift like preacher curls where people aren't egotistically attached to their performance output, it's a little bit easier to maximize for hypertrophy because you're not worried about what your performance is relative to other lifters. When you take something like a bench press where everybody's asking how much do you bench? Uh, what, what do you bench? What do you bench? You hear that question all the time. 
I think this psychology factor comes into play because you get rid of that buffer room. So you're telling me somebody that's power building and using the bench press with a moderate arch, not a huge arch, just a moderate arch, maybe a slightly narrower grip, a controlled eccentric, maybe a pause if you like pauses, you're leaving performance on the table. And a lot of people do struggle, myself included, or at least I used to, to be able to actually bench press in a purely hypertrophy stimulating way. A lot of the time it devolves into powerlifting where you try to get the biggest arch you possibly can. I used to do mobility drills to get my arch bigger because I was so obsessed with just getting the biggest bench possible. And then when it comes to progressive overload too, you're incentivized to hit false progressions because you have that buffer room. So if things aren't going well or you don't feel like training as hard, you can always make these tiny little tweaks and put false progressions in your system because you have room to be stronger, like quote unquote stronger in that lift, at least in a powerlifting sense. You can widen your grip ever so slightly. You can arch a little bit more each time. And this happened to myself where my gains really stalled out, but on paper, I kept looking better. And I kept telling myself I was making gains because my numbers kept going up, but it's just because I was starting to cheat more and I was so much more focused on my performance on paper than the actual stimulus I was getting in the lift. And instead of chasing the hypertrophy that I could get from that lift, I was chasing the numbers. And I think lifts like the big three, a lot of people fall to that. I think the push up and dip are great for chest and tricep hypertrophy. I think the RDL is better than a deadlift typically. The hack squat, however, doesn't quite compare to a regular squat. The hack squat, on account of how the movement is set up, with the load being directly above the hips, likely doesn't do a great job of growing your glutes, nor your adductors, or even potentially your lower back. The squat, low bar or high bar, does a great job growing the quads, the gluteus maximus, the adductor magnus, and even potentially the lower back. The hack squat simply doesn't do this. So I do disagree with him here. I, I agree with what he's saying, but I think I disagree with his perspective on this. When it comes to something like a hack squat, the reason why it's such a popular lift for bodybuilders to use is because it maximizes your growth in your quads. You don't have your hips taking over. You don't have anything else becoming a limiting factor. The hack squat forces you into the best knee flexion that you can possibly handle. So since your hips are supported and they're pushed up, it maximizes your knee flexion. So, so as long as your tempo and your range of motion are under control, you can basically maximize quad growth through this. And this is where I think the methods start to diverge a little bit, where if you're training for pure bodybuilding, I would argue it's better to try and have a lift for each muscle group that maximizes the growth in that muscle, whether it makes it the prime mover or the limiting factor, or it just works well with your actual structure. Something like a hack squat, in my opinion, will always beat out something like a barbell squat for your quads because your quads are guaranteed to be the prime mover in that lift. And of course, you do run into the issue of yeah, well, now you're leaving spinal erector gains, you're leaving glute gains and adductor gains on the table, but of course you're going to have other lifts to target those, those muscles too. If you're training purely for hypertrophy, you don't just squat and say that's all you need for your glutes, for your spinal erectors, and for your quads. You're going to be doing more lifts anyway. So I would say instead of trying to put all your eggs in one basket and get maximum growth from one specific lift, I'd say pick a couple different lifts that you'd be doing anyways. You can get away with doing less volume in most cases with this if you just have a higher exercise variety that are more directly and locally targeted to the muscles that you're trying to hit. So for myself, I would pick a hack squat and an RDL and a hamstring curl and then some calves over a high bar squat and then whatever else you have for that day. More importantly though, when it comes to replacing the bench with a push up or a dip or the squat with a hack squat, there's a psychological motivation component. Most people get motivated and gain some self-efficacy by seeing other people achieve greater things than themselves. And really, how often can you compare yourself to someone stronger than you on the hack squat? So this is where I do definitely disagree with him. I would say, I see where he's coming from, and there are people that this is good advice for, people that will train harder by having a strength goal in mind. That's a, that's a good training approach for them. But for people that are motivated to build muscle, this approach is distracting and it will take you off track, in my opinion, and at least in my experience. What I see a lot of the time in people that I've lifted with and myself, obviously people I've seen in the community, people that I've trained to, an approach like this, 
isn't necessary because you are motivated to get bigger. If you're in the gym to get bigger and you're training for hypertrophy, then you shouldn't need motivation to train hard because you're training hard to build muscle. And you're not competing in a specific lift, you're competing in quad size. So instead of saying, oh, I want to get a bigger squat than this guy and saying, oh, well, you can't hack squat because you're not gonna compare your hack squat to someone else. That's a valid point, but at the same time, if I'm a bodybuilder and my genuine innate desire is to have bigger quads, then I'm gonna train my hack squats hard and get the most stimulus that I possibly can out of them because I wanna have bigger quads than the next guy. So this is where I think, I don't know how Milo trains himself, but I would say it seems like he's coming from a perspective of somebody that really likes getting strong and really likes lifting in itself and likes to get big. So somebody that should be power building, there's nothing wrong with that. But for people that want to train for pure hypertrophy, motivation is not an issue with the lift because you are obsessed with intensity, training as hard as you can, and getting your volume in, controlling your eccentrics. It's not about the weight that you're moving, it's about how hard you're hitting that muscle in a, in a stimulative term, in a stimulative sense. Are there really that many people around you doing five reps on the hack squat that you can compare yourself to? Is there a sport centered around hack squatting from which you can draw inspiration as to how much stronger you could get, how much harder you can push? The odds are there isn't. So I actually kind of disagree with that. Uh, if you obviously we have we have social media now, so you can watch what all the other top bodybuilders are doing. If you feel like you need some motivation and you are kind of driven by strength and performance, even if it's a hypertrophy-oriented lift, like a hack squat, which you can chase strength on as long as you control your range of motion and your tempo on, you can chase strength on it because you can't really cheat your form. The, the machine locks you in really nicely versus on a, a squat bench deadlift, you can shift your body around however you want and escape kind of the hard parts and that, that deep stretch. So you can be strength oriented on machines and i'd actually argue from a physical perspective it's more optimal to do that than to chase strength on something like a barbell a barbell lift like the big three for example so i would say with this this is where machines do have their their place and this is why i do think machines have a benefit compared to free weights in most cases for hypertrophy and i would even say with social media a lot of the top bodybuilders are very strong on lifts like a hack squat. Like if you look at say AJ Morris or Adam Powell or really any of these top bodybuilders, and I'll, I'll probably put a picture link these guys in here somewhere. They train very hard and are very strong on a variety of machines. And these guys are high level natural bodybuilders that post up all these lifts. And these are just two examples. Once you start to get into the natural bodybuilding community and you see everybody else making these YouTube videos and commenting on these videos, or if you go on Instagram, TikTok, you can see all these top guys and how they train and you can compare your machine lifts to their machine lifts. So it's, I would say, yeah, I mean, there's no direct competition in a one rep max or anything, but with social media, you can see other guys training these lifts pretty hard. And even if you're watching someone else do an entirely different lift, you can still learn that intensity from another lift and just apply it somewhere else that is more directed towards a lift that fits you better physically or a lift that's just more stimulative for hypertrophy. So when I see like a strong man or a power lifter or someone like that training hard, I don't want to copy that exact lift and what they're doing, but it does inspire me to actually train hard just in something that's closely related to what I'm actually looking to get out of that lift in terms of hypertrophy. And so the psychological motivation component, the enjoyment component is often a lot lower with movements like the hack squat. And that is a perfect sign of somebody that's put their reward. You put your psychological reward in your performance. If you're training for a hypertrophy and that's purely what your goal is and what your innate desire was when you started lifting in the gym, you're probably going to end up leaving gains on the table by doing that. And now you're not even going to get that same fulfillment that you came into the gym for in the first place. If you came into the gym just because you wanted to get bigger and then you got sidetracked by strength, I'm not saying it's not okay to change your goals or just start to chase strength and realize you might enjoy it more. That's totally fine. But I think if you go into it and you focus on getting as strong as you possibly can and powerlifting and focusing on things that you didn't actually want to, I think a lot of the time you're getting distracted by shiny objects. And when I started chasing the powerlifts, 
it was like a nice ego boost because I was strong. People always told me I was strong and I could compare myself to other people and everything looked good, but my physique was lacking. And while I was chasing powerlifting and getting good at it, it was ultimately just an egotistical venture for me because ultimately I just wanted to get bigger. And that now that I'm bigger and I have the physique that I want, or I'm, or I'm at least on the path to doing that, it's a lot more fulfilling. And I really feel like I'm maximizing my time in the gym and also just enjoying it more. A lot of people that are training for hypertrophy don't actually enjoy the training themselves. I'm not saying you can't enjoy it, but we enjoy the results. People that train for strength enjoy being in the gym because that's their place to go perform. When you're training for hypertrophy, the gym is just what you have to do in order to like quote unquote perform outside of the gym by having the best physique that you possibly can. So that's where I see a performance oriented mindset where the highlight of your day is going to the gym versus a more of like a quote unquote uh, what do you call it? Like an art, an art form mindset, I guess, for bodybuilding, where the gym is just what you have to do to perform outside of the gym. When you leave the gym as somebody that cares mostly about strength, and that's what you take pride in, I'm not saying it leaves entirely because it does build a, a good amount of confidence and everything, but your physique doesn't necessarily come with you the same way it would when you're leaving the gym training purely for hypertrophy. I hope that makes sense. Next, natural hypertrophy refers to many buzzwords as to why powerlifting might be worse. He mentions central nervous system fatigue, stimulus to fatigue ratio, less tendon strain, better range of motion. Now, I'm pretty sure... Yeah, the, the central nervous system fatigue is an interesting one. Um, I'm not going to try and debate that one. I don't make that case a whole ton that's probably a point that I would just leave alone. I don't think that's a major factor, but I do think overall cardio respiratory fatigue is, is a factor when it comes to using lifts that are highly fatiguing. I don't think we need a study or anything to say that a set of eight to 10 on low bar squats, even if you're just going to parallel and not even getting full range of motion, is just more fatiguing in a systemic sense with your heart rate going up your breath getting taken away, that can kill the rest of your workout or lower the intensity for the rest of your workout. So of course you could talk about conditioning and general physical preparedness with this, but at the same time, if you have an option that can get you just as much, if not more direct local stimulus to the target muscle with less systemic fatigue as in cardio and respiratory fatigue, I think that's pretty obviously the better option for hypertrophy. When it comes to the tendon uh, tendon wear and tear and stuff like that. I'm not going to debate that a whole ton. I would say in my personal experience, your joints do obviously get worn down pretty quickly if you're just sticking to three lifts that put a lot of wear and tear on your joints, because obviously you have to stick with those lifts quite a bit if you want to excel in them and you genuinely enjoy doing them. Where hypertrophy, you're not really tied to any specific lift. I, I am an advocate to keeping your lift in as long as you want in your program until your body kind of tells you no and gives you warning signs of overuse injuries, but yeah. He doesn't have citations for any of these things, certainly not central nervous system fatigue, stimulus to fatigue ratio, tendon strain. Yeah, I, I do kind of agree on that. I don't think we know in quite enough about CNS fatigue to be making valid points about that. If you want to talk about stimulus to fatigue or central nervous system fatigue in reference to how much fatigue you're building up in a cardio or respiratory way, I think that's totally valid because we can feel and experience that ourselves. We don't need a study for that. Uh, but at the same time, going into something like tendon wear and tear or central nervous system fatigue in particular, I'm not, I, I don't think natural hypertrophy meant it in a very specific way like that. I think that's probably just the words he chose. Uh, I don't think at least me personally, but I don't, I don't think we know enough as a community to be making very specific points about words like that. And I don't think he really understands range of motion. He's denounced Lincoln partials before. I think we all sort of agreed with the fact that the negative was most important because it's what the muscle lengthens. And so the lengthened portion of the movement and of the range of motion is also most important. And from that was birthed the concept of lengthened partials. So lengthened partial is in reality the love child of something like a, like a weird cluster set rest pose plus like biomechanics because it entails essentially that you're going to do your set and when you are done with your set and you can no longer hit full range of motion, you're going to do partial reps in that portion of the range of motion where the muscle is lengthened, so the end of the range of motion. But I would be happy to have any citations that he has on hand. But my hunch is, these are just some buzzwords that a lot of people use mistakenly 
to justify their training choices. Sometimes it's good to have a movement with a shitty resistance curve because it forces you to fight certain uh, through certain sticking points that are going to then be very, very, very challenging for the muscle. Next, natural hypertrophy makes... That's an interesting one. Um, I would say when it comes to resistance profiles, I think... I think it's fairly obvious that obviously a, a lengthened bias or a, just a mid-range bias generally is the way to go. Lifts that are very short and biased are just super awkward unless, unless you cheat with those movements. So take something like a row, for example. Usually I'm an advocate of cheating with your rows or at least uh, moving the weight in a very kind of controlled yet explosive fashion. Uh, obviously with resistance profiles, we don't have quite enough evidence i would say to what resistance profiles are good or bad i don't think it's that black and white but i do think obviously we're learning that the stretch and stretch mediated hypertrophy and just the length and position in general is highly potent the weight claim that sumo deadlifts only exist because they allow you to shorten the range of motion and as a result lift more weight putting aside the fact that about 50 percent of lifters those in the higher weight classes or heavier weight classes typically deadlift more conventional than sumo. The idea that sumo deadlifts are less range of motion than conventional stems from a pretty heavy misunderstanding of range of motion. And I can talk about this because that's kind of my PhD, you know, Dr. Milo Wolf. Range of motion should mostly be viewed as the degree of angular motion at each individual joint during an exercise, as opposed to the movement of the bar, right? Yes, the movement of the bar is a little bit lesser during a sumo deadlift compared to a conventional deadlift, but as far as hypertrophy is concerned, and as far as joint angles are concerned, you get more knee extension range of motion at the knee, right, during a sumo deadlift versus a conventional deadlift. You get about the same hip flexion range of motion during a sumo deadlift as a conventional. And so, while there's less range of motion... Everybody calling my sumo deadlift invalid. He's proven you guys wrong. In terms of how far is the bar moving, as far as actual joint range of motion is concerned, the two lifts really aren't that dissimilar. Next, natural hypertrophy makes this claim that power builders or power building doesn't have any methodology. My question is, if you're not going to compete, you're training for fun, you want a good blend of general strength and size, why do you need a super specific methodology? There really isn't any super compelling evidence in the first place that periodization plays a large role for strength gains and certainly not for hypertrophy. So why would they need super intricate periodization when they could just get a good amount of size and strength training as they currently do? For example, why would you need to taper and why would you need to peak and spend several weeks on this that you could be spending actually training instead when you're just maxing out for the fun of it, right? You could just go into the gym and max out. Will you perform your best? No. So I'd say with this, I think a lot of the time people that are power building do care to to peak or taper, whatever the term is, to test their one rep max. I'm not an expert on peaking for powerlifting. I'm very rusty on the subject since it's been a very long time. But at the same time, I don't think powerlifting or power building, my bad, is just going and testing your one rep max randomly. Like I would say, even even for bodybuilders, you can test your one rep max every now and then and, and it should be totally fine. Of course, it depends on the lift and of course it depends on your level of advancement and everything. But this is a little bit different than uh, just maxing out every now and then. I, I, do think, I do think a lot of power builders care more than, care more for their one rep max than just kind of doing it for fun. I think it goes a little bit beyond that. But equally, what you have to go through two or three weeks of weird training and or deloading slash tapering in order to get your best performance and you're not even competing? No, you won't. And in general, this trend of speaking about power builders themselves as if he has a few power builders in mind he really hates, instead of power building as a concept, continues. Where he says, power builders don't put any effort into accessories, blah, blah, blah. Again, it just seems like hating on the people more so than the method. You can absolutely put effort into accessories as a power builder. I know many people that do. So let's try and focus on the concept rather than the people. So I think with this, one flaw in this approach is that you're even calling it accessories in the first place. I used to do this too. And if you look up the definition of accessory, which we should all know anyways, uh, at least if you speak English, accessories, an accessory is something that is inferior and supports something else. It's just a little bonus. It, it's on the side. It's not the main course. It's a side dish. And I think when you have that approach, as silly as it sounds, just saying that 
word accessory subconsciously implies that the lift is less important. And I can speak from firsthand experience. I used to be pretty heavily involved in some of these power building communities. And again, this kind of goes back to the mainstream where myself and everybody else involved in this community, which keep in mind is, was much bigger than this little noble natty community we got going on here. We all half-hearted our accessories and none of us really cared to try. We would only post the big three lifts, the squat, bench, deadlift. Nobody cared at all about their arm training. People didn't even know how to do curls properly. They, they wouldn't even like program them. If you look at my old power building program, I didn't even program arm training. And we wonder why, I used to wonder why my arms wouldn't grow because I thought all you need to do was squat, bench, deadlift and you'd have big arms, right? So that's an important thing to take into consideration in my opinion. He then claims that all these power builders have spider mode physiques. First of all, that's a completely insane term. Second of all... Yeah, I mean, I... Natural hypertrophy has a great point on the spider mode physiques. It's not, and it's not to make fun of somebody. I think it's just, it's just to point out that if you train in this specific way, you can see when someone is attached and incentivized to increase their strength on one lift, we, we, whether it's suboptimal or not, we can debate that. At least training the power lifts hard will get you more growth than doing fluff and pump work for bodybuilding. But you can very evidently see in a lot of power builders and a lot of power lifters physiques that train in what we would classify as power building, a lot of these guys don't have big arms. And I speak from firsthand experience about this, where people tell me that I have good genetics. It's like, okay, well, if I have good genetics, then why didn't my arms grow just from doing bench and pull-ups? So we see a lot of the success stories. We see the Russ Wolves. We see these guys that build great physiques from power building. And that's fine. There are people that can get away with it. But you don't see all these people that are like just regular average lifters that take their training very seriously thinking power building is the way to go to maximize size and they don't make it or at least their physique is entirely incomplete and if you look at my minimalist will fail you alpha destiny response video you can see that even when i had these massive numbers my physique was incredibly underwhelming and that's with quote unquote good genetics like imagine what an average genetic genetically gifted person would be or someone with below average genetics in just just to be transparent i don't think i have good genetics people just tell me that i think it's just because i trained hard enough and doing it long enough but not everybody makes it we see all the success stories but like i used to follow these guys that had great genetics and perfect builds and they would train in this power building way and i wanted to look exactly like them and if it wasn't genetics it was at least peds and they would just have big physiques and look great because of that and then when a re regular average joe like myself went to go do it the the gains magically didn't come and it, it turned out it wasn't because i had bad genetics it's because I didn't have great genetics and I had to modify my training to be much more specific to get to their physique where they could just kind of do whatever they felt like and it would work because they were gifted for building muscle. The impact of the exercise order on hypertrophy really isn't that clear from the research. Just because you do your arm work or your back work after your squatting or benching work doesn't seem to say that you'll necessarily see much less hypertrophy than if you did it first. So the idea that you could just do your arm work first in the session and get a lot more hypertrophy and avoid the, ooh, the spider mode physique, that just doesn't seem to be true based on the research we have. Furthermore, by doing so- I agree with that on a, on a physical level, for sure. I think a lot of the time, if your program is set up properly and each session is set up properly, you should be able to train through the full workout totally fine. When you have something like the big three in your program, there's no doubt that you're going to be more fatigued by the end of the session. So I think from a physical perspective, it can be a little bit fatiguing, whether the research says it or not. I think just in our own experience, we can say that the lifts towards the end of the session, if your program isn't set up properly, are going to be less stimulative because, because you are more physically fatigued. But at the same time, a lot of this does come down to psychology, where a lot of the lifts that you do at the end of the session will be less stimulative because you're just not training them as hard and you already feel accomplished from say having a successful bench session and you hit a PR earlier in the session so 
uh, even even with that on the other side of the spectrum, let's say you hit a hit a good bench PR at the start of the session, you might be just complacent and satisfied with that, and you might not care too much for the rest of your session. And on the other side of the spectrum, if you have a crappy bench session to start, it might kill your mood for the rest of the workout, and you won't train as hard. And I, I'm not saying this is again, it's psychology, so it's very subjective, and it's it's a person to person case. But these are instances that I ran into all the time when I cared heavily about performance on very specific lifts and didn't care so much about performance on the other lifts. Where I take a, a passive progression approach these days, where I let my progression happen naturally and I'm not chasing it by any means necessary, I find that I can put a very consistent effort throughout my entire session. And even if I do a certain lift last, it still gets a very good amount of stimulus and I still make just as good gains with that lift as I would with my opening lift. So even now, it's not necessarily an issue that I was putting my arms at the end of my sessions beforehand, but psychologically that was holding me back. But now that I've changed my psychology and changed my approach, I can do something like a preacher curl, basically last or second to last on an upper session, and I still make just as good gains doing that as I would if I opened with it. Move your compound lifts first, especially for example a squat for at least five reps. You might actually be putting up more size overall. In bodybuilding specifically, there's kind of two main factors here, right? There's conditioning, but that's besides the point. But there's also muscularity and symmetry. In terms of muscularity, training your quads, your glutes, your hamstrings, your pecs, your triceps, as you would during powerlifting first in a session, is gonna really emphasize the X taper, right? That X frame that is really prized in bodybuilding. Likewise, as far as symmetry goes, it provides a nice blend of lower body and upper body as far as providing a nice shape. He also puts forth this idea that you need to isolate every single muscle group in your body if you're power building or bodybuilding. The truth is you don't. If you wanna compete in bodybuilding, would you be well advised to actually isolate a lot of the major muscle groups? Yeah, probably. But the point here is, power builders don't necessarily care about their calves. Shout out Omar Yusuf. Maybe they just want to grow muscle overall, enjoy their training, get a little bit stronger, and that's it. Not everyone. Yeah, and that's fine too. If you if you don't care to maximize your entire physique, you just want to be generally a little bit bigger and you do care about performance and strength, there's nothing wrong with that. And that's not what me or natural hypertrophy, I can speak for him on that because I've watched enough of his content. That's not necessarily what we're trying to say. But I think for somebody that's training purely for hypertrophy, this is where things get to be a bit of an issue where you are going to lose uh, basically performance, not performance, uh, program real estate when it comes to things like forearms, calves, neck, abs, etc. Not everyone needs to min-max every single muscle group. Natural hypertrophy then makes the demonstrably false claim that the hypertrophy rep range is between three and 15 repetitions. We have data showing that doing sets of three is far less efficient than doing, say, sets of 10. In fact, doing seven sets of three with three minutes of rest was equivalent for hypertrophy to doing three sets of 10 with 90 seconds rest. Doing those triples took the people 70 minutes. Doing those sets of 10, those three sets, two people 17 minutes, and they saw the same growth. And so yeah, sure, if you're happy to spend five times or four times the amount of time in the gym, be my guest, do triples. But there's a good chance that both as far as time efficiency and as far as how much fatigue each set causes versus how much hypertrophy it gives you, doing sets of three really shouldn't be part of the hypertrophy rep range. Based on the research we have, the true hypertrophy rep range is between five and 50 repetitions. Finally, doing those sets of three in your training is probably just gonna bang you up a little bit more. So just as a broad recommendation, I don't think you should recommend sets of three for hypertrophy. Natural hypertrophy goes on. Yeah, I would say sets of three, probably not the most efficient. The lowest I personally go is five, and that's for uh, a length and biased compound lift. Three is, yeah, I, I, I agree with Milo here. I would say three is less efficient. Four is fringe, but I just don't see the need to go that low. Uh, there's no way that you can't milk out more rep gains with a certain weight to make that weight jump a little bit less daunting to the point where you land at five or six minimum, and that's on like a heavy length and biased compound movement. Uh, yeah, three three is a little bit too low. When there's there's infinite infinite numbers, I think the the first three numbers that exist besides negatives should probably just be avoided to misunderstand intensity, saying that a lot of influencers say, oh, you need to train really intensely for a powerlifter, but not so intensely for a bodybuilder. That's either a straw man or just displays a lack of understanding of what intensity means in a sports science context. Intensity in sports science refers to percentage of one rep max within lifting, right? And so, yeah, bodybuilders don't need to train with as much intensity. 
Powerlift doesn't need to train with high intensities, aka high weights, in order to be specific to the sport. But bodybuilders or people interested in gaining size, they don't need to do that. Finally, natural hyper- Yeah, so it's, I mean, if you talk about intensity, it somewhat means something different to everybody. I would say in powerlifting intensity is, of course, relative to your one or max. So what percentage are you using? The closer it is to 100% is the higher intensity. For hypertrophy purposes, that basically makes no sense outside of rep ranges. It's pretty useless. So I would say intensity as a bodybuilder, when someone like myself or another bodybuilder refers to intensity, we're just talking about proximity to failure. So not how much weight you're using, how close are you trading to your desired proximity to failure. Hypertrophy just refers to anecdotes from silver era and bronze era bodybuilders saying, you know, they didn't train with heavy weights. They, they, they focused on hypertrophy rep ranges and those good movements like the hack squat, etc. You can use anecdotes to any level. I know plenty of power builders that are bigger than natural hypertrophy. Does that make power building better than pure hypertrophy training? No, not for gaining size. But that's the point of this video. Power building is a good approach if you want to gain size and also want to gain strength you might gain about 80 or 90% of the potential size and strength you could gain if you were to simply dedicate yourself entirely to one pursuit or the other. So it gives you a really good blend of both. And more importantly, this is for people who aren't competing in either powerlifting or bodybuilding, or who just want to enjoy their training and structure it as they wish to. Dogging on powerbuilding is really not constructive. And I think more importantly, people should train as they please, especially if there are no competitive endeavors. So I'm going to stop the video there. The rest is just his outro. I would say when it comes to competing, I don't think it matters if you're competing or not because the standards are so wild for, for bodybuilding especially, but I'd say even powerlifting to an extent too. I think if you're somebody that isn't competing, but you still want you still have that competitive nature, it's okay to compete in a non-formal way. It's okay to compete against other guys in the gym that are your buddies or other guys that you look up to on social media or something. And that's totally fine. Just because it's not an organized event doesn't mean you're not training in a competitive way. And even then, if you're not competing against another actual person, as corny as it is, I think you're still competing against yourself, at least to an extent. I know for myself that if if I'm stagnating, even though I have no desire and I can't stand bodybuilding competitions because it's just a diet competition, in my opinion, of course, muscle mass is a factor, but besides the point, I like to make progress and I take my training very seriously. This is like the one thing in my life that I really, really push hard for. I'm a pretty well-balanced, like chilled, relaxed guy outside of this. But I think there's a lot of guys similar to myself that while we don't have these like competitive, like organized competition desires, I think we still train it in a very serious and competitive way. And like the point I made in my last video, I think that's why guys like Chris Bumstead or all these other big influencers have such massive followings is because people want to be like these guys. People want to be elite lifters and maximize their potential. So whether you're competing in a formal sense or not, I think people do have this desire. So uh, with that being said, that's all I got for today. Uh, I appreciate Milo for making that video. I agree with a lot of what he said. I didn't agree with some of what he said, but I think overall this is a productive talk about hypertrophy programming. So hopefully you guys had some good takeaways. I'll probably have this up sooner than later. So with that being said, I will see you guys in the next one.